My name is Steve Bishop. I'm the director of the International Studies Institute. Uh, so I'm one of the people who helped organize uh, this year's fall lecture series, which is called Peacemaking in Africa. Uh, one of the other uh, people, in fact, the person who is primarily responsible for organizing it is Ian Stewart, who's right over there. Um, doesn't even want to raise his hand. Um, too modest. <laughs> there he is. Um, also, we got a lot of help from uh, Loyola Chastain, uh, who is the administrative assistant for the International Studies Institute. She's not here uh, this evening, however. Past her work hours. Um, there are also, though, a bunch of other people I want to thank, because although ISI is supporting this lecture series with uh, you know, uh, work and materials and, and money as well, there's a lot of other uh, organizations that have helped uh, fund this. Uh, the, the one, you know, first and foremost, without question, is the New Mexico Humanities Council, which is an organization in the state of New Mexico, obviously, uh, that, that supports a lot of humanities initiatives. Uh, they pay for, I mean, high school uh, sort of competitions, for speakers, for lecture series, obviously, uh, for, you know, more art-oriented exhibitions and so forth. Uh, they do have a website. I'd encourage you guys to check it out. Uh, not just because they gave us uh, a sub substantial amount of funding to, to run this, but also because they do have a lot of really interesting programs all throughout the year. Uh, some of the other uh, groups that have helped us uh, are the Department of Foreign Languages and Literatures, the Department of English, the Department of Anthropology, uh, the Department of History, uh, the, oh, I'm forgetting someone now, the, oh, the Women's Studies Program, and then I also definitely don't want to forget the World Affairs Delegation. The World Affairs Delegation is a student organization, uh, and if you're interested in knowing more about what they do, you can talk with Andrew here, because I'm now going to introduce Andrew. Andrew Baker is an undergraduate here at the University of New Mexico. Uh, he is studying, he's doing a dual degree in political science and population health. He's also the vice president of the World Affairs Delegation, who's always looking for more student members. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew, who is going to introduce our panelists. All right, uh, thank you for that introduction, Dr. Bishop. My name is Andrew Baker again, the vice president of the World Affairs Delegation. Um, we have our meetings every Sunday from four to 5.30 up in the third floor of the sub. Uh, and I'm glad to see all of you here today for the, uh, internet, or the lecture series on peacemaking in Africa. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to our discussion panel. We're gonna have a quick story from each of the uh, panelists, and then we're gonna go into a uh, question and answer phase. We're talking today about the uh, refugee crisis in the Great Lakes region of the Central Africa. So we have our guest speakers today, Stani Nzabarinda, Peace is a bio, and Martin, Ndiyasenga. All right, I'll pass it off to you guys. Uh, I can be sitting there, okay. Thank you, Andrew, for introduction. Uh, as you said, my name is Tani Zabarinda. Um, from Congo and Rwanda. So I was born in Congo, grew there, and then uh, flew uh, to Rwanda when I was 15. Then um, I lived there since uh, until 2017 when I moved to USA. Um, I have been living here for two and a half years. And um, uh, now, right now, uh, I mean, currently I'm working with Lutheran Family Services, which is a, a refugee resettlement uh, agency. I'm case manager. Thank you. Oh, uh, maybe I can pass to you. Then. Thank you. Good evening. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, my name is Peace, as you mentioned. And uh, I'm lucky that my name is in English, so it's, it's much easier. 
Um, my last name means God knows me. It is a bio. Uh, I'm Rwandese. My mom is Rwandese. My dad is Rwandese. I was born in Rwanda uh, in 1992, so you guys can guess my age. Um, my dad, as you guys know about Rwanda, we have two tribes, which, no, we have three, but the other one is not the biggest family, there will be two big ones. So one is Hutu, and one is Tutsis. And I always like to say that I'm both, so I'm really lucky. Um, 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 I left Rwanda when I was six years old. We left because my dad, he couldn't stay in Rwanda for longer. Reason why, because when the genocide happened, which is 1994, I'm sure a lot of you guys know, um, they decided to think all oh, Hutus were killing Tutsis. So my dad is Hutu, so that means he will be killing my mom, which didn't happen. So after the war in 1996 and 1997, I remember like people come and take him to the studio and ask him questions. So in 1999, after my sister was born, they decided to leave Rwanda. So I'm not first born of six, we had three girls and three boys. Uh, we left Rwanda when we were four, four kids, and uh, we moved to Uganda. So we left Rwanda because my dad couldn't stay in his own country anymore because of the starving of peace, the thought he was killing, the thought he was part of genocide. Long story short, we moved to Uganda. I have 10 minutes, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Just checking. Um, we moved to Uganda, and the funny thing is, in Africa, Majority, when you're from a different country, people know where you come from. So when we moved to Uganda, they knew we weren't Ugandan, because we didn't speak Ugandan, the language, which is called Uganda. And uh, they just didn't like my mom's tribe, because she was Tutsi. And our president, born out of Port Agame, he used to be in Uganda, I think, government, I have no idea. So they hated my mom. And uh, because they hated her, they tried to poison her, they tried to kill her, and then we decided to leave Uganda. So we left Uganda, we, moved, we went to Tanzania, and when we got to Tanzania, we were on our way to South Africa. We were planning to just go live in South Africa and probably go to Canada. But we, back in days, there was not like, oh, you need a passport, you need a visa, it's all about money. If you have money, you need to go. And that time we were living on my, the savings that my parents saved before we left Rwanda. So we, when we reached to when we reached Tanzania, they were like, "No, you guys can go to South Africa. It's they don't ex accept um, refugees. You have to go back." So my dad is like, "I'm not going back to Rwanda because I don't want to keep going to the prison or questioning that I was in the war." So we spent, I think. 15 days in a prison in Tanzania, and then finally they sent us back to Kenya. Then we lived in Nairobi city for six months in a hotel, living on my mom's and dad's savings. So that time they're not working, so we're just spending the money we, we, we took from one month to that. And then I think we're at the point where we have not much money and we don't know what to do. In Kenya, they speak so in English. We didn't speak so hard, we didn't speak my English. And we were just changing the money from Rwandese France to Kenyan shillings. And uh, when we were almost done, I think a guy was like, you should go to UN and tell them you're not about to go back to Rwanda or whatever. But anyways, when you live in Kenya, you need to have what we call protection. It's like when people come here, they need they ask for CM seeker, so they get a green card or something else. The same thing as in Kenya, you have to have a paper that lets you live in the country legal, like so you don't get deported too, because they do the same thing too, like here. Um, when my parents said that we we're gonna go to UN and become refugee, I hated it. I was like, I'm not a refugee, I didn't come. I was a little shy, but I was so dramatic, I was like, I didn't come. We didn't do nothing, we didn't steal nothing, we didn't become, we're not going to become refugees. And my dad was like, well, you have to understand, but when you leave your country and there's no peace, and I'm always in the, the police, and I'm always in the prison, that means I can't go back home, because who go back, 
he will never see me. Someday they're going to take me and take me Russia. Russia was, uh, it's a thing in Tanzania where they take people, they assume they were part of the genocide. So it was almost to that point for him to be taken. And then they say, he said, I'm not going to go back. And I want you to understand, as I know, I'm not a refugee. I think refugees are about people. I know we're not about people. So I had it. I had the name of Honey Refugee. And while we were arguing in the morning, we woke up like four in the morning, I went to UN. And when the guy went, he was like, people were sleeping outside, in the tents, cooking outside, they went to the bathroom outside. I'm like, no way, this is not my life. We can go back to Rwanda, we have maids and we have house and we feel there. Why do we need to live here? Later on, my mom was like, this is why we're going to stay here. We can't go back because this and this reasons. If you don't want to die to ever see you, then we will go. So I say, okay, for the sake of my other siblings. So we stayed in think It's not a bit of a decision for my parents, but I just say yes to, so they can feel, I can feel better for myself. Um, so that's when we, be, we, we, we began the journey of refugee to Poland too. Uh, applying for protections, applying for a CMC in Kenya. Later on, we end up in, um, in refugee camp 2004. Uh, refugee camp in Kenya is totally different. It's, there's two camps, there's one Islamic and there's one for Christian. So the Christian one, they call it as well there. So we end up with the Islamic. And I learned so many things about Islamic. And I spent my life in refugee camp. After six, seven years, uh, we met a girl, her name was called Devon, and she's my life saver. She came to the refugee camp to do internship. And then she told me, hey, you know what? Why are you going to go to America and you're going to become this and this and that? I was like, Devon, really? Like, seriously? Like, do you see my life here? Like, I'm good, thanks. Like, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to dream about it. I don't want to. Please do not. Do not disturb my peace. I'm good. I'm good here. Because in refugee camp, you you get used to it. You make a peace. You go to it. You go at it. You don't care about it. It's just you wait for the food at the first every every first of the month. That's when you want gives you food, and you go to school when you can. When it is where you run, you come back. <coughs> we to run almost every other day. People are fighting, people telling each other, and you just go and come back. It's like it, it becomes normal. It becomes normal life. Um, and when you want told me that, I was like, no, the one don't even go there. And she came back to her saying she applied job to be, she applied job in the UN, and she started working on our case. And every day she would call me to say, I told you guys in front of America, I was like, it's gonna take forever, I know, it takes a long time. So finally, we got called to go do interviews um, for with the embassy, with the U.S. embassy. So it's a long process to come to America. It doesn't just happen overnight. It's years. It takes a lot of a lot of time, a lot of interviews. They question you again and again and again and again and again. They ask you the same thing to see if you're lying. They ask your children if you guys a probably been to the rice last night. And then if they ask me and they say we ate rice and my dad say rice and beans, that's not true. They're gonna say, oh, maybe they're lying. And some people get reject, rejections and some people go, oh, maybe she forgets that. But they ask you so many questions over and over for like years and years and years. And we'll, you go through a um, medical check, they make sure you're healthy, they make sure you don't have any disease, it takes forever. And then after all that, we were able to do orientation, which took like six months. And then after orientation, we came to America. And when we came to America, let me tell you guys, I was like, oh, this is not America. Take me back. <laughs> it's ghetto. I don't go back where I came from. It's better that way. Oh, why is so cool? You know, it's just different. You know, the way they talk, they talk about America, the way they say America is, it's not how it is. I'm sorry. I mean, I live here now. <laughs> but when I got here, I was like, oh, I expect to live like in where, New York, somewhere fancy, you know, with the, the nice cars and nice clothes and good stuff. Um, but we didn't get that. 
So that was like another like depression. You have to go through that depression and and overcome that because when you're in Africa, they brainwash you. They tell you America is this good, and then you come here, it's different. It's like another country. You just have to make it. Uh, and when I got here, my English was really, I thought it was good because I was talking to Devon. When I got here, nobody could understand me. Everything was ra and re and el, and it was confusing because in Kenya, there is a lot of el and al. I would say looms instead of rooms, you know, like weird things, and I would say water instead of water. And, and when people ask me where you're from, I would say Rwanda, they would be like, oh, what is that? Is that like, like a desert, you guys live with a zebra, and I'm like, no, we actually live with snakes, like we're talking about, you know? <laughs> and, you know, even a lot of people that don't know what is like different countries in Rwanda, in Africa, I know, pisses me off because before I came to America, I spent more time educating myself about USA. I'm like, Texas is hot, New York is fun, more people live in Miami, there's a big beach in Miami, maybe, I don't know, you know, all that. But then you get here, there's like a lot of opportunities computer or internet, but people don't know what is Rwanda. They're like, oh, is that a country? It's a city or something. I was like, no, it's a country actually, yeah. Um, then um, after arriving, I went to high school in Texas, ninth grade. Um, it was crazy because I spent much time not understanding what my teachers were saying, and most of them would tell me, oh, you're not gonna make it. You have to speak English in America. I'm like, okay. I'm trying, uh, and a uh, few years later, I met people from different countries, and then I was able to go to make a connection, went to school, I went to high school, I graduated with 3.75 GPA, yay! <laughs> After I struggled, and then I went to college, I studied social work, and I graduated, and then I got a job, yay! I made it, so now I'm a US citizen, and I work for Catholic Charities, that's my story. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Okay, this one. Um, I'll give you that. Maybe we need this one. So my name is Martin Daisenga. I was born in Burundi, but I would say I'm from the Great Rex of Africa. Why? I end up picking up the culture for that region. I was born in Burundi, our native language is Kilundi, and uh, our official language is French, the most spoken in uh, that area. And in 1995, two years ago, after our first elected president was uh, assassinated, I had to take a way to go to Tanzania for safety. And that's where I learned the Swahili. And I'm glad that I grew up there because I think it's Swahili, the pure Swahili from Tanzania. Even though it is spoken in different places, I know here at UNM uh, they're teaching Swahili too, but if you need to learn very, very Swahili, get in Tanzania, Dar es Salaam. And uh, I spent um, about 11 years in refugee camp that's where I grew up, and that's where I did my high, uh, high school education. I did what I could do, but you know, as she was talking about refugee uh, lifestyle, it's very hard. You have a limitation. You are not, uh, you are not, uh, um, you are not flexible. You need to stay in a refugee camp for all the time because you to get uh, a passport or to get a, a refugee travel document. I think it's came right now, but a long time even to to get outside of refugee camp when you are stopped there, you are in jail because you are supposed to get there. So that's the lifestyle I survived in uh, 2007. Through the refugee settlement program, America approved our settlement application. My wife and I met out here. God bless America for uh, approving our resettlement program because that was one of the refugee solution that can end up that refugee situation is still staying refugee forever. So now I am a citizen for uh, United States of America. 
I can, um, I can exercise my citizenship rights. Yes, I am a US, I'm a US citizen, but I will say I am a Burundian American. Even though when we get through the um, citizenship um, interview, they ask you, are you going to accept to drop down the citizenship we had and get uh, and be only American? Yes, I will. <laughs> but that's what I need to be on a paperwork about in me. Home is a home, no matter where you were born. Refugee Resettlement Agency program solution, yes, for life, for humanity, it's complicated. I am here, but my mom and dad are over there in Burundi. Would you mind I can forget them? I had to speak, to, I had to talk to them at least twice a week, at least. If it's mandatory, I have to speak to, uh, to talk to them every single week, uh, every single day. My wife, all her family, mom, and all her siblings are all the way in Australia. So imagine how we can live. We are here, they're in Africa, they're in Australia. How your mind would be uh, would be stable? You can't. You can imagine I've been in Australia twice because we had to. In 2011, my mother-in-law was so sick and the children were crying so crazy and my wife is the elder of all of them. And they said, mom is about to pass away. So there's no choice, I say, my wife, I pack, pack, I pack up and I go see before she passes. And they went there. And the people after they see you, oh wow, in America you're so rich. How did you made up to go from there and get up here? It was my wife and I with uh, and, uh, two kids. But we had to, because in African culture we are strongly bonded. It's not common you can find out one member in New York, another one in California, another one in Texas, another one in Seattle, more of the time we, can, we try to come together. And in the case of death, or someone about to pass away, or a wedding, all we need to come together. And the last year, I ha we had to go back again because of my first brother-in-law, she was getting married. She said, my brother-in-law, I need you here. You need to be here. I, cannot, I could not excuse myself because that's how we are strongly bonded. And to see me there, to speak, to welcome people, to stand in, uh, um, on behalf of my, uh, of my father-in-law passed away in 1997, it was making sense to the family. That's the challenge of Refugee Resettlement Agency. Yes, we met up here, we are studying, but that's how we're thinking. I know there are some refugees here I know they are all dreaming about their homeland. Talk to their family, left there. Try to bring them here, to try to support them financially. We started to share what we have. As a work, I, uh, the job I'm doing is the third. When we come here at the refugee, we needed to pick it up a job we were given by the Refugee Seminar Agency standing out much better. That's when during refugee resettlement agency, all during our orientation, they said, the first job you offered, do it. My first job was housekeeping, and it was good. I, I, my second job, I've been working as a patient care tech at UNM Hospital for many years. Now I am working for Refugee Wellbeing Project, is a program of UNM. If you need to know more, you can go online on UNM website. You will see me there. You can call me anytime you need to do, uh, to do anything. We are still looking for volunteers. Volunteers, you, are, you can make a difference. Because the refugees, they, they come here empty-handed. 
even your English can make sense because refugees, they, ne they need someone, they need to exercise too, someone they need, because my English when I came here, I know even now I'm giving her the time to hear me because I'm speaking with English with the accent, the accent from four languages. That's how I am. I am multilingual. I cannot speak English well like American because that's what my life story was. I could not imagine I can end up in America. So you are welcome if you need to, uh, to volunteer. We can match you with a, family, uh, a refugee family and you can uh, do whatever you think you can make to change someone. And for community work, as P said, we've been together in school. I am a social worker too. I'm outside in the community trying to provide social services to refugees, also to Americans, because most more people, they reach, to, uh, they reach out to us asking some questions. Some people need to learn more about refugee status. If you need to know a, a, a refugees, at least one, I am here. Come you talk to me, I will tell you about myself. Because we are not ashamed to say that we are refugees, because our story will make us strong. Since 2011, I'm on a national level for Refugee Congress. It's a national organization. We come together as a delegate from different, different states of the uh, United States. Most of the time, we gather near Washington, D.C. to talk to our official elected to tell them more challenge about refugees. Try to push some bills that are broke, that are beneficial for refugees. It is so sad now Trump is trying to close out the refugee resettlement program, but I'm not sure he's going to, be, uh, to, to succeed because the refugees are lucky. If one, if one door is closed, God will, make, will open another one. We are believers because you cannot rule the world forever. No. If one is here, time is counting, he will go, and someone will come and open the door again and again and again. So that's a few words I can say. Now I am here for another grant. I have another title called I'm a Refugee Community Leader for African uh, uh, Families. It was a grant provided by Kellogg Foundation pretty much to get out, to speak, to shout if something happens, if there is a family in a crisis. A week ago, a manager gave a, an eviction notice to one of our family. She knows. And we went there, and we have to reach everybody, hey, we need to stop this right now. And we made it, right? Yeah. Because you cannot discriminate refugees because you are not understanding English. There are some people who can say, hey, I have a paper, tell me what that means. When I went to the family home, they told me there is a letter. We found out it posted on our door, but we don't know what that means. Uh, give that to me. Open. I, did, I didn't make a motion because it was so scary. They were given seven days. I tried to ask them some questions, some questions that to calm them down. I told them, uh, can I have this letter go with me? They said, yes, go with it. And the next day I have to contact the, the, our connection because we are connected. And the people reach out to the men and say, this is not right. And now the refugee family is still there. We did it, peace. We did it. We did it. <laughs> That's why we are in the community. We are refugee, we are citizen. If there is anything we can do, we are citizen, we can vote. Mm -hmm. We will be outside in the campaign. We are listening to what those politicians, for us, the politicians are liar. <laughs> because most of the time, what they say with the truth, it's overlapping. But we will be there, we will vote, we will, we will shout with you, we will try to change the system and make our life better together.
Thank you so much. I think I still have my nine minutes. That's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I didn't talk much about me, uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, I said I was born in Congo, then um, I flew to Rwanda because of war in 19, 1994. So when the war genocide happened in Rwanda, uh, some people who did genocide flew in Congo. Then we were living in Congo, then um, uh, they brought this ideology and then we we were also victim of the genocide. Then we we flew to Rwanda. So where they were, it's like exchanging the places. So we left them in Congo, we went in Rwanda. Um, so um, life in Rwanda was um, not that easy after the genocide, but uh, we survived. Uh, I didn't go to a refugee camp. Uh, my family was able to to resettle in Rwanda and um, um, pay my school. And then um, I end up becoming Rwanda citizen. So, um, so as far as the uh, conflict and peace in Great Lakes, it's uh, really complicated. And um, sometimes it's uh, ethnic conflict, and, uh, but mostly fueled by politicians. Uh, in Rwanda, I was able to finish school, uh, a bachelor then start working there until I moved to USA uh, by green card lottery. I don't know if you are familiar with that. So I say lottery, uh, it's like uh, applying for green card, coming to work in USA, sometimes you get, you, you win it. That's how I came. So um, life here, uh, as my uh, colleague said, it's not easy when whatever school level you have, when you get here, you see doing job that you are offered for the first time. You, even if you are a doctor or PhD or masters, I don't, doesn't care. I mean, doesn't mean anything. So um, I started working as caregiver then um, for almost one and a half years before uh, becoming case manager at Lutheran Farm Services. Uh, that's basically my story. I'm married with four children. Yeah, my wife also is working at a young clinic uh, at uh, Southeast Head Young Clinic Center. Um, I think that. That's good. Thank you. So what, what we're going to do now is, if anyone has any questions, you can ask the question, and then I'll repeat it in the microphone, uh, just so it's easy for everyone to hear, and then, of course, they will answer. So. Does anyone have a question for what? Yeah, way in the back. Uh, my question is, uh, what are your feelings for Paul Kagame? Okay, so the question is, what are your feelings about Paul Kagame? Oh, I'll answer that. And you. <laughs> Go Thank ahead. you so much. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. So uh, I left Rwanda when I was about six years old. Uh, that's when he was becoming a president. A lot of people don't seem to like him, but I love him. He took my country from a mess to a greater. He's doing a great job um, in my own way. Some people don't see great, 
but uh, I also have negative negatives that I see from it because he's I'm still on this I'm like you said we are always citizens but home is always home my grandma lives in, lives in, in Rwanda my parents go to Rwanda almost every year and I'm gonna marry a Rwandan, a Rwandan. so I'm not planning to go back Rwanda to live there in time soon but uh, he's doing okay he's doing a great job and uh, a lot of people don't like him I can just tell you that yeah. Um, <clears throat> as peace said, um, uh, he Kagame have been doing great. Um, he's he, uh, he has a military background, so some kind of um, he has also some kind of dictatorship, I can say, but in the right way. So he's bringing country to uh, uh, at least he's doing development for Rwanda, yeah. and um, I know he's somewhat hard to his uh, opponent, like opposition leaders. He's too much hard for them, and also he has big influence in the Great Lakes region. So, um, for as far as Rwanda is concerned, I think he's doing for uh, Rwandan interest. Mm -hmm. It may not be in the interest of the neighbors, uh, neighboring countries, but at least Rwanda is being developed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me say one, one more thing. So I lived in Uganda and Kenya, those two countries. Uh, when I look back, I think Rwanda is doing much better than them. I'm sorry, I'm not offending anybody. Please forgive me and not getting filmed. Uh, when you look at it, it's way much better. Like it went from zero to 1,000. And I'm saying because I left Rwanda when I was young, he just left Rwanda, he can witness that, we see a lot of YouTube, another video, they're doing great. So when I look at those three countries that I lived in, I'm like, they are, he's actually doing great than the country that I keep, I land into, live in. So, yeah. So the question is, in what ways have, or have your cultural identities been affected or changed by living in the refugee camps and by coming to America? So you talk about being yeah. still Rwandan, still Burundian, etc. But in what ways has that maybe changed through your more recent experiences? Do you want me to go first? Let me go first. Let me go first. <clears throat> yes. Um, our life will be, have been changing. For example, it should be very hard for me to speak Swahili if I was not, uh, I didn't uh, used to live in, uh, in Tanzania. So, and also that mean, uh, for example, for after my high school graduation, we had to come together with the Tanzanian citizen to work in, the ref uh, uh, to work in refugee camp for refugees. That means we had to pick up some culture for Tanzanian culture also to mix up to us. Pretty much this is a good topic we are more the time do, dealing with for refugee wellbeing project, the project we have here at UNM. We have a program, uh, we have a, um, a, a program called, uh, it's, um, I'm not sure if I can say it's a program, but we have a time we come together, it's called the Learning Circles. We come together, refugees and uh, uh, US citizens, we come together, we sit down, we, be, we bring up a debate. For example, how do we celebrate uh, um, uh, Christmas in Africa? And uh, Iraqi, they tell us if they do, or in Africa also we try to exchange what's 
how we, uh, how we do things. And also, when we come in America, I uh, don't think in, um, uh, in Africa we have a Halloween. No. We don't. We, in Burundi, we have another celebration similar to um, Thanksgiving. That's the one I really, really like in America, I find out, because it's making sense to me. And also we have another similar cultural party that we have in, in, uh, in Burundi, I think in August. When the families come together and you express yourself, oh, thank you, and you say in the name of someone, for example, thank you, John, for doing A, B, C, D for our family. It is great. And I learned from here in America when you needed to say to someone, when he's still alive, he can hear or she can hear. Mm -hmm. Because more people, they like to say someone, oh, he was, oh, she was a great after. They died. They died. But I say to someone where they're still alive, so they can understand, they can get a feedback. This is the example we pe I pick it up from American culture. And I really, really like it. And when I'm talking to my family members now, if I heard something that uh, good happened, I cannot finish my call before I say it. I heard about this. Thank you. Tell me if I can help you out. Yeah, pretty much the time we've been around in our Africa. That's why I said I am from the great rest of Africa. Because I can speak their language, Kenya Rwanda, I think at 80%, because I left with the Rwandans. So pretty much that's how it was. Yes, our life has been changed, and our ID has been changed, and it is good. It's make us as we are. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. So for me, uh, because I grew up in an Islamic refugee camp, I'm going to say like what changed me. Um, I had to work a job. I'm a Christian. I'm a Jesus believer, a God believer. And when it comes, I'm sure I have my students here, so I hope I don't offend you guys. So when it comes to Islamic, they believe in Muhammad and they dress hijab, and I respect that. I learned so much about Quran. I'm proud of myself. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. um, but living in refugee camp, it taught me, it changed me in two ways. Number one, dressing. So I had to cover my hair. I have to make sure my body's covered. It wasn't by choice, it was like, you better do it. Because I needed to go to school. And also, in Islamic culture, Somalia, where I lived, you get married by 13. So you're not supposed to go to, it, to get education. So for me, I was breaking so much rules for that culture. Other way, other things that changed me was, you have to learn different languages. Why? When we got there, we were the first family when these living in refugee camp speaking Kenya Rwanda. They were Congolese. I never met Congolese in my life, that was the first time. Sudanese, I never met tall guys, way dark, like way darker. I'm like, Lord, I didn't know these people existed. You know, Arabia, Kuwait, Somali, you know, Ethiopia, Algeria, all different people. So when you see them, you're like, oh, well, how am I going to communicate? So you start picking up their language, their culture, you go to their weddings, you eat their food, you try everything. So for me, that changed me. I became like international, apparently. Um, yeah, and then coming to America, because I live with everybody comes, and I live with a lot of people, different people from all over Africa, I could say, probably, because Sudan, Sudan, Ethiopia, and then we have East Africa, Congo, and Burundi, and all the side of Africa. Uh, when it came to USA, I was more like open-minded, so nothing really scared me or changed me besides that in December you have to spend so much money. <laughs> and um, I guess I, I work with that, I work and I save up until I make sure everybody, I please everybody in my family and my friends. Yeah. I don't know. <clears throat> uh, they, uh, they say um, almost everything, but uh, what I can say is um, uh, uh, refugee life or immigrants, they change almost everything. Maybe um, except like language and um, 
some um, family bonds, like you said, but almost everything changed, like um, food, um, the way people talk to each other. Uh, uh, like in, in my culture, when you, uh, you meet someone, you shake hands. But here, uh, I guess, it's not often. So uh, almost everything, um, yeah. So we try to, when you move like you move in the USA, you try to be like, to behave like a USA yeah. citizen. So you 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 lose most of your culture, and because yeah, sometimes like you one out of hundred people, you won't change their culture unless you conform. I mean, you change to their culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I can say, thank you. So, yeah, right. Hi, I just want to say thank you so much for coming to speak with us. And it's an honor meeting you three. It's incredible. And I just, I want to ask, what would you want America, and I guess in a broader sense, the world to learn and know from your experiences? OK, so the question, if you couldn't hear in the back, is first of all, he thanked them for uh, being here and talking to us. And then he asked them what they would like sort of America to learn from them, from their experiences. So I guess what lessons they can give to the US or the world in general. Um, my response would be kind of complicated. I was surprised um, I was in a refugee camp and the when I was checking was uh, the food we were getting for, and to see uh, countries donating more for a for refugee a program, USA is at the top level, okay? And then try to follow up on the news, and I found out US is on the top level to finance our government that we, we fled from. I was thinking, how can this uh, country can afford, uh, can afford the fire? It's hard. Because most of refugees, even we come here, most of people, they came here against their will. That's why even you can see as developed, we can uh, go through education, we can, but when you are forced to leave your homeland, no matter how it is, mm -hmm. it's still in your heart. And that's why I didn't say, I didn't say anything about the first question that was coming up. If you need to learn about any leader in worldwide, if you need to do first do a research, what's the relationship that leader have with the United States of America? United States, I can say I'm not afraid. If they need a president to stay on a, on a, on a throne, they can do it. I'm not going to say you because you're America, because there is some people somewhere who are deciding how the world needs to go. And it is wrong. If you can say that leader needed to get out and try to, to, to create a conflict in, a conflict in that country <coughs> and have people kill each other, now it's wise that the genocide happened in Rwanda the consequences was known before they do it. Imagine. It's already spoken. They said if we shoot down that plane, the population will be angry. A certain number of these people will be killed. But it's OK. Let us do it. Let the people go. How can you feel about this? And that's why we can see why the world is red like that. It cannot be like this. 
America cannot, cannot create a war or all countries. All people cannot come here. There are even people, I know about two families. When we came here, two families denied the US visa. They said, no, we don't, know, we don't need to go there. Why? Because they have their citizenship feeling in themselves. They said, as soon as my home is going to be in peace, I need to go back. So that's why when you are electing, more the time when I, I, I approach those, political, uh, those politicians, I need to understand them what is your po politic on international level. To understand if they're going to, land, to let my homeland safe. Because all, all Burundians cannot come here. You don't have the space. And are you who are paying taxes to finance the wall there? To work every single day and facing the wall, people are killing and often people to come here for a visa, they end up here with, with the severe PTSD symptoms, with the mental health, with a lot of stuff. I saw Americans crying after they heard our story to see a woman in Congo who were raped in front of her husband and the kids, everybody over there. It is not complicated for Congo to, be, to, to, to have a peace. But there is a benefit behind it to let the conflict going on so that the Congo underground can be stolen, get cheap, but have people still killing each other. That's not fair. We know it. But that's why we needed to approach there's some stuff you cannot, um, you, you cannot say it. I know there is a delegation of, from Banyamurenge tribe who went in Washington, D.C. to meet an official elected to tell them, please protect our family who are in Congo. Let them live safe. Because they can see what they have been, uh, uh, what the plan cannot, okay, cannot be achieved because it's killing each other wherever you go. So, but we are here, we'll say it. Hopefully something will change. Thanks. I think for me, um, including myself, because now I'm a US citizen, uh, is that when we look people, we don't see love and we don't see color. And I, I don't speak because of black or white. I don't know about that. I call myself African American. I don't call myself black American because I'm not a color. I am a human being, right? So instead of looking people down, saying they came to my country, imagine if something happened to USA, where would you go? Mexico is right here, right? Do you think they will let you in and the way we're treating them right now? It's a question we need to ask ourselves every day. You make so much money and there's way to donate. Donate. If you in school and you want to go to internship, go out of your way, go somewhere else. I didn't choose to come here, trust me. I didn't choose to become a refugee. That was not my plan. It was never my parents' plan. My mom was a midwife in Rwanda. She made great money. We lived on her savings for three years. It's a tons of money until we went to refugee camp. My parents never worked in Kenya, they never worked in Uganda. They worked in a refugee camp and they worked here. My mom, she makes probably $9 an hour from being a doctor to $9. That's a pity, it's killing her hair. Slowly, slowly, I'm aware of that. So, when you hear about refugee, don't think, oh my God, the country is horrible. It's not the country, it's the people. It's what is, in here, and it's what other people makes people do. It's what makes uh, people, what makes me, what other people makes me do. You know, there is a, a court saying, nobody was born knowing how to hate. Mm -hmm. That means we can all learn how to love. Yeah, so man, did yeah. I say it? Yeah. <clears throat> I think, uh, what was the question again? 
Oh, what would you want American people to learn or to learn? So, um, in fact, uh, most of the conflict in great religion, they are financed by um, the country in the West, including USA. So, um, this is, is through the ads and most of the companies go there, like all the phones, uh, I mean, uh, raw materials are from Congo. So uh, those money goes to, uh, they give corruption to uh, 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 the leaders over there and they create war so they can get cheap raw material. So um, I think uh, to be a refugee is not the choice, as she said. So uh, please, uh, if you, I know you have voice, just uh, let uh, your representative or our representative know that whatever they do, the aid they give, is uh, they have to make sure that is being well used, not uh, creating uh, conflict and crisis and refugee um, is not right. So it's like today, right now, as Martin said, my my people right now they are being killed in Congo. So, um, and because of this, uh, like international uh, network that creates conflict in the region. So, it's, it's um, we can say that, uh, please, if we can say something to uh, American leaders to try to stop those conflicts because we know they have much, much influence on African <coughs> leaders. Mm. Thank you. So our, our official time is over, but I want to encourage you all to do two things. Uh, one thing is if you have more questions, uh, to come up here and ask the questions uh, individually. Uh, or, I mean, you can ask them to all three of them, of course. Uh, the other thing is, though, as they all have mentioned, they work for various organizations in town. Uh, you know, things like Lutheran Family Services, Catholic Charities, the UNM African Wellbeing Project. If you guys are interested in, in helping out, here's some people who would love to sign you up. Uh, so I encourage you to do three things right now. Uh, one, uh, come up and ask more questions. Two, ask them if you're interested in helping out, ask them how you can help out. And three, uh, giving them another round of applause. <laughs>